The Epistle to the Hebrews constitutes one of the most difficult sections of Bible for those of us who have embraced a Messianic Jewish perspective. Thankfully, D. Thomas Lancaster, First Fruits of Science, Director of Education, has spent years penning a commentary which will enrich and enlighten you. He's here today to give us a sneak peek, and I trust that you'll find his insights helpful. Put your hand in mine together. We will walk in harmony. Let me introduce you to my teacher, the rabbi from the Galilee. You're listening to Messiah Podcast, where Jesus is Jewish and that changes everything. Messiah Podcast is a production of First Fruits of Zion. Well, welcome back to Messiah Podcast, and we're here with D. Thomas Lancaster. He's the Director of Education for First Fruits of Zion, and you have a new book out, and... It's a commentary on the Epistle to the Hebrews. So um, I want to explore the context for this commentary. So you're a, you're like a pastor, right? Yeah, I, I like that, uh, sort of analogous to a pastor. And part, and part of a Messianic Jewish synagogue. So the title pastor doesn't really, you know, it doesn't really fit so well, um, but I'm certainly not a rabbi uh, in any sense. Um, so... Um, you know, we've used awkward, like kind of monikers, like, or, you know, like congregational leader, which doesn't fit well on a business card. Uh, but you know what I do, I teach here. This is the thing. I'm a teacher. I teach here. And I've been doing that for about 21 years, something like that. Nice. So recently you did, um, a thing on the epistle to the Hebrews. Right. Well, no, I, I, let me recently being like in 2010. So, uh, no, it's not been so recent. It's been a oh, while. No. Uh, yeah, I taught through the entire epistle of the Hebrews, and this is my second run at it. Uh, the first run was back in 2003, and uh, and so then I wanted to return to the material to develop uh, s- some of these exciting ideas a little bit further. And I spent about a year um, with the congregation working through the epistle, you know, just verse by verse, really, just, you know, chapter by chapter, working through the epistle together from a Messianic Jewish perspective. Um, and I mean, we had a lot of fun with it. It was, it was, oh, I did sure. anyway. I don't know if, I don't know, I don't know if, if the people sitting up uh, have, you know, forced to listen to me had a lot of fun, but I had a lot of fun teaching through the epistle uh, at that pace and, you know, to spend a year like really dipping in. So that was, but that was a long time ago. That's like 14 years ago. And I always intended to, um, you know, to, to package this this work up in in one of these these books, yeah, you know, I did one on Galatians. Look uh-huh. here, yeah, oh, I love that. Epistle of Galatians, Galatians yeah, yeah, based on teachings presented at this at the synagogue, Beth Emanuel Messianic Synagogue. Uh, that was a series, and and so these are the, the subtitle is Sermons on a Messianic Jewish Approach. Uh, then mm-hmm. there's uh, this one, Ephesians, newer, yeah. Ephesians, yeah. And so yeah. I just taught through Ephesians a couple of years ago. So same thing, sermons in a Messianic Jewish approach, uh, being an approach to the epistle. And and then here's this work from 2010. But this is just the first volume of two. Um, oh, yeah. Because this one only covers chapters one through seven. Uh, I'm we're gonna we're with God's help. We'll release the rest of it. Uh, you know, within the next twelve months. Uh, it's pretty much all written. It's just waiting to get packaged up. You know. Yeah, you've done you've done the hard work. Well, I appreciate your saying that, and you've been a part of this process as well because we pay oh, you money bit. to actually read my work uh, <laughs> to, to help me polish <laughs> the writing. Don't. Uh... Don't don't give every, everybody the secret sauce. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I I go through some stuff. You know who you know who's the real hero in all of this is Candy Bishop. She just goes ahead and 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 she. Yeah, I know. I don't know how she does it, but um. Yeah, it's it's amazing. She, she's, so it's, she's she's incredible. She's our proofreader. You know, before yeah. there there's like before Candy Bishop and after Candy Bishop. And before Candy yeah. Bishop it was like uh, all of our work was just riddled with typos and so shout out to Candy. So um 
You know what? Like the the deepest wish of my heart is to move to where you are and like listen to you talk every week. <laughs> um, that sounds achievable. <laughs> Look at my mug here. Yeah, I got the I came home to Hudson mug like that. I'm drinking my tea out of. You too could be the proud owner of one of these mugs, Jacob. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, it may, maybe it will happen for me, but um, but I don't. I don't think everybody knows the the how special beth emmanuel is and so maybe you can take a second and just sure. sort of um tell our listeners what's like how special and how good the thing is well, that you're doing there in, in hudson wisconsin i i think everyone is special and every congregation is special to begin yeah, with but but not we're as a much as you yeah <laughs> some some are more special than others uh <laughs> i didn't know um yeah, so I might be a little biased um, about Beth Emanuel, but what's what makes it unique, and put it that way, what makes us different than most uh, Messianic Jewish congregations is that you really do have like an expression of an Orthodox Messianic Judaism happening here at Beth Emanuel. So it's a yeah. it's you know halakhic Jews living uh, halakhically Jewish lives uh, mm -hmm. in community together, and um, you know trying to form a minion and uh, you know, which we're able to do, thank God, pretty regularly, and uh, and 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 doing a completely uh, halakhically or orthodox uh, synagogue service together on a regular basis. So that's yeah. I think that's that's what makes us a little different. You know, so it's like you go to a Messianic Jewish congregation. Ordinarily, you can expect sort of a charismatic treatment of a synagogue service. You know, with some yeah. you know, kind of like a. Maranatha Hillsong mashup yeah. vibe yeah. with some liturgy, and and so we're not like that. There's yeah. just not too many places where you can there's go not a and lot. get this. Um... Right. There's 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 not a lot, and and there's a reason for that. It's it's not something that appeals to most people. You know, it's like a, a full on Hebrew liturgy and full on Hebrew Torah reading is, it's uh it takes um a special kind of uh, person to want to participate on a regular basis. Yeah, sign me up. But uh, yeah, you're right. So you, you took like a year going through the epistle to the Hebrews, one of the more difficult books of the, of the New Testament to interpret from, from a Messianic Jewish perspective, right? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And we have this, um, not, and, and it's not because of any content inherent to the book itself, but it's just been like, it's got, it's gotten a raw deal, right? It's been misinterpreted. So maybe you can give um maybe you can give our listeners yeah like a broad spectrum sort of what what is the epistle to the hebrews and what was the, what what's what's going on there okay okay it is like you said you know it's difficult to interpret from a messianic jewish perspective because you know it, it's like until until we really understood the approach of paul within judaism and distinction theology, and, and that Paul is talking to Gentiles, and not, and not, you know, his his uh, he's not addressing a Jewish audience when he's you know warning about uh, you know uh, works of the law or or whatever he's, he's mm -hmm. speaking. Yeah. Until we understood James Dunn, that in, James Dunn figured that out. Right on. So until we had these pieces in place, I mean, it, there was a universal misinterpretation of Paul in the church for mm -hmm. most of the last two thousand years. Uh, yeah. Right, and we're still just emerging from that. Well, Hebrews is not, you know, Hebrews has has its own. It's been similarly misunderstood for most of two thousand years, and so there's this overarching like uh, paradigm of interpretation, the replacement theology, and uh, uh, idea that rules the way that Hebrews is understood and interpreted within Christianity, and has been for for most of. For, for most of the time we've had the epistle to the Hebrews. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you, if you step back from that, you step back from that misunderstanding of Paul, first of all, and then you say, okay, well, perhaps we've also similarly misunderstood the epistle to the Hebrews. How would we understand this book if we assumed that it's in concert with the teachings of Yeshua, the teachings of Jesus regarding when he says things like, don't think that I've come to abolish the Torah until heaven and earth disappear, not the least stroke of a pen or the smallest jot or tittle are going to in any way disappear from the Torah. Uh, 
how would how would that work with Hebrews where it appears that the writer of the book of Hebrews is saying the temple is canceled, it's replaced by the heavenly temple, the priesthood is canceled, it's replaced by the priesthood of Messiah, the sacrifices are canceled, they're replaced uh, by the sacrifice of the Messiah, the old covenant is canceled, it's replaced by the new covenant, you know, you go on and on and on. It's like, oh, look at this, this is ground zero of replacement theology. So that's what's yeah. made it so difficult for us to, um, to I think, to to assess and address squarely from a messianic jewish perspective okay so that's the challenge so someone out there is is you because you're talking about paul and there is this sort of um there is a tradition in the christian church that maybe paul wrote this yeah book and he definitely didn't yeah correct correct you got it uh there is a tradition that he maybe wrote it there is there's a tendency for people to want it to be paul because oh, paul's yeah. their favorite yeah. <laughs> you know, uh, but uh, and, and there is this there there's there was some hope back even in the early days of uh, you know when they were putting the canon together that maybe it was Paul that maybe Paul well, wrote like, in Hebrew and it's and, it's and, like and, it's he's because there's well, why else is it in the Bible like like the, everyone's right. looking for an, an apostolic connection for um, the sure. canon right right and it's like no oh, you're if right Paul, if if Paul didn't write Hebrews then why do we have it. But right. it's very yeah. good. Like I love Hebrews. However, yeah. it's not yeah. it's not Pauline, right? It's not Pauline text. I mean, we know that from several from several angles. We know it's not Pauline text just from the style of the Greek. The Greek is yeah. really good. The Greek is, yeah. is polished. It's, it's not too like good Paul's. For Paul. Yeah. Yeah. It's it is. It's just not that's not his writing style. Um the argumentation style is not Pauline. Um the fact that the writer of the book of Hebrews, the the exhortation that is the epistle to the hebrews uh, doesn't use the first person pronoun uh, until the very end of the epistle that's not paul yeah. uh you know if if paul's writing he's 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 writing from that first person perspective i this i that oh, yeah. you know I, yeah, all all the way through he, he's very um, self-aware yeah put it that way so it's definitely not paul um and I, I think another uh, another approach that um, you know the 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 people who would like it to be Paul, they're also camping on this idea of well Paul cancels the Torah and his writings and this the Epistle of the Hebrews also cancels the Torah and it's so there's that kind of um, mashup some sort of conflation that's happening theologically in their heads. Yeah, for but sure. But it's not Paul. You're right. It's not Paul. Yeah. Do we know? Do we know who it is? Like, what, what's no. your favorite theory? My favorite theory. Um, okay, so my favorite theory, I, this, is, this is how I would put it. It's not an apostle. Uh, we know it's not an apostle yeah. because the writer of the book of Hebrews refers to the apostles as those from whom we received the word. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They admit okay, so, so that puts him into a second generation that is the, a disciple of the apostles. Uh, so... My favorite theory, and this is something that's, you know, I didn't make this theory up. This is from the Church Fathers. You can find this in Eusebius. Um, it might have been Clement of Alexandria, it slips my mind right now, who, who first uh, offered this tradition, uh, is that it's this, this was written by Clement, the disciple of Peter, Clement of Rome, yeah. the, the author of the, the Clement's first epistle to the Corinthians, uh, mm -hmm. this, the same author. But that's... The weakness of that idea is that it's based primarily on what might be just Clement quoting from the, the epistle to the Hebrews. Uh, yeah. But the strength of the idea is that, well, even if it's not Clement, Clement fits the bill really well geographically, you know, because we're speaking yeah. about Rome. We're speaking of like greetings to the, the, the believers in Rome at the end of the epistle. And Clement is – a second generation. Uh, he's mm -hmm. a he's a disciple of the apostles, so he's someone close uh, to the apostles, and he's also someone who speaks with the voice of authority of the the apostles. In in that he he was he's one of the top disciples, so he was ordained, so to speak. Uh, Peter laid hands on him, uh, yeah, according yeah. to church tradition. So it's and and the writer of the book of Hebrews speaks with that level of authority as he's writing. So my favorite. 
to you know, my my favorite theory on authorship of the epistle to the Hebrews is someone like Clement of Rome. I'm not saying it's Clement yeah. of Rome. I'm saying it's someone like Clement of Rome. The other thing about Clement of Rome is that, according to tradition, he's part of the Pauline school as well. He's he's even though he's mm-hmm. Peter's disciple, he has contact with the Pauline school and. The Epistle of the Hebrews makes reference to Timothy, right? And so um, that it tells us that this is someone within the Pauline school, and and that you know Clement could possibly fit that bill well. So there if you go. If it's not Clement, it's someone. It's someone just like just like that. That's what I'm saying. So yeah. um, let's let's get let's dive into a little bit of exegesis here, um, sure. because when, when you open Hebrews. It just sort of looks like this compare and contrast thing, right? It's like, oh, ba- back then this is how it was, and now this is how it is now. Right. B- before before God revealed himself in this way, and now he's revealing himself in a different way. Right. And um, right. Ma- right. Maybe, you can, maybe you can clarify for our listeners. Yeah. What's, what's happening there in the first chapter of Hebrews? Okay, so... In the first chapter of Hebrews, in in the opening words of Hebrews, where he says, you know, in the past, God spoke to our fathers through the prophets, you know, in various and sundry ways, and uh, and so forth. Uh, but in these last days, he's spoken to us through his son, you know, uh, mm-hmm. through the son. Uh, that could be understood from a replacement theology perspective to say. In the past, God spoke through the writers of the Old Testament, but now He speaks only through Jesus. And so yeah. the revelation that comes to us through Jesus replaces that of the Tanakh. Uh, but that's certainly not the intention of the the writer of the epistle. Instead, the intention of the writer of the epistle is to elevate the revelation of Yeshua uh, by building on top of the revelation that came through the Torah, through the prophets, through the writings, and to say, look, this is all emanating from the same God. And, and he, then he goes on to develop this idea of saying, and if the Torah was give, that was given through the angel of the Lord, through angels, if the Torah that was given through angels came with such severe consequences for its violation that, you know, you, you can be put to death for breaking the, the commandments of the Torah, uh, then how much more so should we be paying attention to the revelation that's coming to us through the Son, who isn't speaking just about this present world, but he's speaking to us about the world to come. He's speaking to us about repentance for attaining the kingdom and the age to come. Uh, So, the the and that is the whole idea of the Epistle of Hebrews is, do not let go of your allegiance to Yeshua of Nazareth, because he is the ticket to uh, entrance into the messianic era, the kingdom, and the world to come. And and you know, don't forfeit that. Uh, don't forfeit that by uh, turning away from him or uh, or growing lax in your devotion to him. Yeah, that's that's the idea. If you get that much out of the Epistle of Hebrews, that's all he was really trying to communicate. Yeah. Again, there's a lot of things we take for granted when we um, read the New Testament. We we don't necessarily understand what everybody was going through at that time. So, okay. So my premise is that Hebrews was written in the early '60s, not the 1960s, but the the '60s. Yeah, uh, w- which is a time period in which the disciples of Yeshua had fallen under increasing pressure from the religious establishment specifically the Sadducean religious establishment, that is the household of uh, Hananiah ben Seth, that's Annas in the New Testament, and 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 Caiaphas, the, the culprits from the Gospels. Yeah, yeah, real bad guys. Because they deny the resurrection of the dead, and mm-hmm. so they really have it out for the disciples of Yeshua, because they're basing their whole thing on the resurrection of the dead, both the resurrection of, of Yeshua and also the resurrection of, uh, in the age to come, that's their that's their big message. So they have it out for them, and w- so we have these persecutions that break out in the in the sixties. Uh, and you have to understand these people control the temple. The the oh, yeah. this is the priesthood. 
It's a big and deal. They have they have financial, political, and uh, religious control over who can access the temple. And so my premise is that they have they have essentially issued a threat to put the disciples on the ban if they don't renounce. And this would be a catastrophic uh, situation for Jewish people in the first century before the destruction mm-hmm. of the temple to, to be told, oh, you won't have access to the temple any longer. It's like, what? You know, the, this is, yeah. the, the temple is the center. It's the center of our faith. This is where the God of Israel reveals himself and, and through, through the temple and through the priesthood and through the ministrations that are happening and through the sacrificial services, uh, this is this is the source of of God. You know, this is this is the vector for God's blessing as He outpours His blessing upon the nation of Israel. And this is this is t- t- towards the temple. That's where we direct our prayers. You know, we we turn towards Jerusalem when we pray, like Daniel did in Babylon. Uh, you know, to to be told by the high priesthood uh, that you're on the ban, that you you don't yeah. have access to the temple unless you you renounce your allegiance uh, to this Yeshua of Nazareth. Uh, that's, I think that's what's going on here. And so the writer of the book of Hebrews is, is writing and saying, look, I realize that, uh, you know, this, this is the, the temptation is to, to, to backpedal and mm-hmm. to say, well, you know, maybe he is the Messiah. Maybe he isn't the Messiah. Yeah, yeah, maybe <laughs> that kind of thing, that kind of thing. But he's like, his, his entire point is, look, the temple on earth is a reflection of the heavenly temple. The priesthood on earth is a reflection of the heavenly priesthood. Uh, so he's not he's not suggesting that one replaces the other. He's saying these are different venues. So the heavenly mm-hmm. temple, uh, this is this is the temple for the world to come. Likewise, the new covenant uh, is is the covenant for the messianic era and leading us in into the age to come. Uh, whereas this the the old covenant as he you know terms it right the first covenant is what he really says yeah the first covenant uh is it endures as long as this age endures like like Yeshua said uh, until heaven and earth disappear but the writer of the book of Hebrews says but heaven and earth is disappearing and it's about to disappear it's quickly it's growing old it's fading it's oh, yeah. becoming obsolete heaven and earth are what's becoming uh, is what's fading and becoming obsolete so you, so we need to be concerned with uh, the age to come and not just this age. So don't, don't forfeit uh, your high priest and your sacrifice and your access to the temple in heaven and the age to come for the sake of this present world. That is the main thrust of the epistle of the Hebrews. And he, he's, he even states this right, right at the outset. He says, for it's not to angels that the world to come is, was given, and it's the world to come that we're speaking about. That's what we're talking about. So you have to know from the outset of the epistle what it is we're talking about. We're talking about uh, the age to come, the Messianic era, the age to come, uh, after which we enter into Olam Haba, uh, which is eternal life, eternal life, the resurrection of the dead, and eternal life. You mentioned this. This there's this dichotomy in Hebrews, right, with b- between the old covenant and and the new covenant, and this is this is an issue that you know I like in my Torah club, and everybody is just like seems to be confused about this, because you have this, you know, in Jeremiah and Ezekiel, you have this new covenant, and it's with the people of Israel, and then and then here we are, right, you and me, right, we're not Israelites. No, you and me, we're like the token Gentiles on yeah, yeah, exactly. staff at First Fruits of Zion. <laughs> exactly. Uh, Hebrews goes into this like in great um, detail, like painfully, just sort of talking about this. The, the old covenant is passing away and the new covenant is here. At the same time, it's like, oh, this is the epistle to the Hebrews. I'm not a, I'm not a Hebrew. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. What what yeah. what have you to say to um to all of us out there who are not Hebrews who are okay sort sort of trying to find our place in this in this thing? Okay, well, that's, a, that's really a great question. Um, to to begin with, I think it's important to to differentiate between this age and the age to come, and to understand that we are not in the age to come yet. 
And so as long as we're not in the age to come, according to the book of Hebrews, uh, the first covenant is still in place. So the Torah is still in place. All the commandments are still in place. But those, of course, that's, you know, a, more of a Jewish concern. Yeah, yeah. We're, we're playing by Sinai rules. Yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah, we're still playing by Sinai rules. Uh, the new covenant, according to uh, the book of Hebrews, which is just quoting Jeremiah, so according to the prophet mm-hmm. Jeremiah, is for the age to come. That's for the coming messianic era, at which time he's going to make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. He's going to uh, remove the sin and the iniquity of the house of Israel and the house of Judah. He's going to establish the nation of of, of Judah and Israel. He's going to recreate the people so that everybody in the nation will know the Lord. And no one mm-hmm. needs to say to his neighbor, know ye the Lord, for they will all know him from the least to the greatest. This is the new covenant. This ha- absolutely has not happened yet. This yeah. We are absolutely not there yet. This is so, so, you know, people say, well, we're under yeah. the new covenant now. It's like, well, yeah. that would be nice, but no. Um, no. The new covenant is the covenant for the age to come for sure. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, and we're looking forward to that. But your question, how do we fit into that? That is a question that the epistle of the Hebrews does not address. That is not even, <laughs> not, not oh, even no. interested in this, in, in, in answering your question, because that's not who he's, he's, this is not Paul. That's not yeah. Paul writing. And Paul, you know, which I should have mentioned, you know, when we we're talking about authorship, how else do we know it's not Paul? Because he doesn't talk about the nations. Yeah. He doesn't talk about the Gentiles. So if you want to know how Gentiles fit into this this covenant relationship, you know what? I'm sorry. This is not your book. <laughs> Try this one, okay? You got yeah. Ephesians, you got Galatians. Yeah, yeah. This is where you're going to have to go for for that material. Um so uh and, and of course the answer being that that Paul is going to say through through our relationship with the King of Israel, Yeshua of Nazareth, uh, we become servants, so to speak, uh, of the King of Israel. I like to think of us like as uh, a conquered people. Like you know, when when the King of Israel takes over the world, you know, he, oh, he yeah. conquers he conquers the nations, right? And then and then he takes he takes. Captives, we, we are those captives of King Messiah. We've we've surrendered to the King. This is how Paul presents it. And so then, through this faith, uh, this Abrahamic faith of the promised King of King Messiah, uh, we're grafted into this whole uh, economy of of the of the covenants. So in Ephesians, he says, uh, "You were strangers to the covenants uh, prior to faith in Messiah." Uh, and uh, foreigners, but now you've been brought near. Uh, so that's the that's the answer. Is our relationship to the new covenant is only through uh, holding on to King Messiah and uh, and and riding in on his coattails, so to speak, to saying, "I'm with him. I'm I'm with I'm with Yeshua of Nazareth, uh, and uh, my allegiance is with him as King." And th- that's our point of entry into what's called the new covenant. How's that? No, that's good. There's this whole like hermeneutical problem, right? Where like, I'm not, I'm not a Thessalonian. I'm not a Corinthian and I'm not a Hebrew. So it's yeah. like a, you know, like my address was, is not on the envelope. Like there's so much there oh. for us to learn from and, and glean from. And that's, it's, it's inspired and, and it's good. Absolutely. But at the same time, like we've been blind carbon copied on this. Does that make sense? Exactly. It's. It, it, I mean, when you say epistle, an epistle is a letter, and a letter is addressed to someone, and it's. Mm-hmm. It's frankly, it's not addressed to us, and so it comes with. It comes with this whole worldview and the set of assumptions, and that that we're missing, and that missing context. Then, if we're just left trying to construe what's going on from 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 the epistle itself, from the letter itself, it's it's completely possible to come to completely wrong ideas. Uh, so, you know, you need, you need the broader context. And what is the broader context? The broader context to interpreting this stuff is, it is Judaism. Mm-hmm. That, that is the missing piece. Uh, specifically, an apocalyptic understanding of Judaism. And by apocalyptic, I mean that this current age is coming to an end. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, and the Messiah is going to, he's going to usher in the Messianic era and the kingdom that's ultimately going to uh, bring us into the world to come, the final judgment in the world to come. That is the, that is the, the Jewish perspective behind uh, all of the epistles in the New Testament. And if you have that in place, oh, it just gets so much easier. The other thing you have to have in place is this idea of distinction that Jews are not Gentiles and Gentiles are not Jews. And faith in Jesus does not make Gentiles into in, into Jews, and it does not make Jews into Gentiles. Uh, you get those two things. If you have those two things in place, you'll do okay. Yeah. All right. So um, I want to zoom in a, a little bit here on um, he, Hebrews talks about the Levitical priesthood a lot, right? A lot. Someone someone could um, charitably find themselves confused to think that Hebrews is deprecating the Levitical the Levitical system and all of the sacrifices and so forth. Right. You have carved out a different path, which I think is valuable and helpful. Can you, can you enlighten us as to what that is? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I mean, here's, there, there's a hermeneutical argument, a piece of standard rabbinic hermeneutics, actually, that, underlies all of the discussions in Hebrews. And hmm. in, in Hebrew, we call that call the Homer. Okay. And call the Homer literally means from the light to the weighty or to the heavy from the light matter to the heavy. So, you know, a fortiori is a, uh, yeah, yeah. People are it more exists, familiar with. It exists in other systems, but yeah. 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 But but specifically in Judaism, and th- this gets used all the time in in Judaism, this this it works out like this. You even have this right in the Torah. This kind of argument, and Moses employs it. He's he he says, you know, God wants to send him to Pharaoh, and Moses goes, the Jewish people have not listened to me. How much how much more so is Pharaoh not going to listen to me? You know how much how much less would would Pharaoh listen to me if 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 my own people won't listen to me? You know, what are the chances that this pagan king is going to listen to me? Right. And, and so the idea is you get, you take the, the one matter, and if the one matter is true and certain, then it should lead to, like, the next thing you propose should obviously be true based on the first, okay? Yeah. That's that's the idea. And, and so we find this this method all through rabbinic literature. It's it's just very common. And, and it runs all through the book of Hebrews. It's oh, just yeah. over and over and over again. Uh, so, you know— like we, I already mentioned, it, right in the first chapter, you've got if the message spoken by angels, you know, was you know weighty and had you know, to, you, you need you need to pay attention to this. How much more yeah, yeah. so if God is speaking from heaven through His Son today? Do we need to be paying attention? Do we need to heed Him? Uh, yeah. Uh, or I think people, or the, I think it, people miss that, right? It's like, oh yeah, people, people read that and they're like, oh, an, uh, they think angels are not like any good. And it's like, oh no, this right, is right. really good. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. So it it totally destroys the logic of the argument all the way through the book of Hebrews if you think that it's the one is replacing the other. Instead, yeah. what you're doing is you are establishing the the weight of the first thing, and you're saying, yeah, but. You know what? Even though that's weighty, that's light compared to this second thing that I'm saying. And you, yeah. so, if you're if you're in with me on the weight of the first thing, you better be in with me on the weight of the second thing. Yeah, so exactly. he does that in in you know chapter twelve regarding uh, the two mountains. You've got Mount Sinai, you know, where God spoke in the thunder and the lightning, and everybody was quaking with fear and. And it was such such a terrifying experience, and God said that not even an animal could touch the mountain or or, or die, and and even Moses' knees were knocking together, you know. Uh, and then on the other hand, you've got uh, Mount Zion, where it says mm. where you know there's thousands upon thousands, myriad angels have you know, and 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 he goes on with all of this dis- description of the age to come of. The, the messianic era and and the age to come uh the 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 idea there is not that the one has replaced the other the idea there is like if mount sinai which is part of this world which is fading away which is passing away which is just temporary if mount sinai was awesome 
how much more so awesome is Mount Zion of the messianic future, right? So yeah. w- we find that running all through the epistle, that same progression of logic runs all through the epistle. So the sacrifices, he talks about the sacrifices, he says, if the blood and bulls and goats was efficacious to sanctify for the purification of the flesh, of the body, uh, here in this world, how much more so will the blood of the Messiah be efficacious to clear the conscience for the world to come, to, to clear, to clear the, the person, to cleanse the person for the, the spiritual cleansing for, for the resurrection in the world to come? Uh, or again, uh, if, you know, the Aaronic priesthood, you know, the, the, the priesthood that ministers Aaron and his sons who minister daily in the temple uh, for, the, uh, for, for, for the annual remission of sins, he's speaking about Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, uh, how much more so this one sacrifice that the Messiah has made when he has entered not into the Holy of Holies on earth, but into the Holy of Holies of the heavenly temple of which the temple on earth is only a shadow and a reflection. So that's the idea. That's the logical progression. Uh, and it runs through the whole epistle. And you have, you people don't get that. They think the first thing is being deprecated in order to elevate the second thing, but that's not it. The first thing is being established as being reliable and true in order to make the case for the, the weightier matter. Yeah, yeah. You do have to like trust the Bible. You have to trust that that's like the gold standard, right? Yeah, yeah. You can't, you can't, there's, there's, you you can't like veer from that path in any way. Like God does not say, oh, I was confused or whatever. Like, right. Right. No, God doesn't change. I, God is not a man that he should lie. Exactly. Uh, yeah. God doesn't change. So, so if we have this initial revelation, you know, it doesn't, it's not going to get scratched. Like, yeah, it didn't work. Let me try something else. Uh, yeah. That doesn't work at all. And, you know, if that would be creating a new religion, you know, that would yeah. be to say, okay, let's start a new religion and, uh, and, and just forget everything and disconnect the Old Testament because we got a new thing now. Um, and of course, that's the way a lot of people look at, uh, the New Testament, unfortunately, oh, yeah. that's how yeah. you end up with uh, a religion called Christianity. Actually, is based on that type of thinking, but that's that's not consistent with Jewish thought. It's not consistent with biblical thought. It's certainly not consistent with the thought of the apostles who build their the entire edifice of this faith, this particular faith in Yeshua, upon the revelation of God through the scriptures that came to us by Moses and the prophets. That is the scriptures of Israel. Uh, so you cannot you cannot build uh, on the one hand you cannot prove your case that Yeshua is the Messiah and we should you know we should acknowledge him as such you cannot prove that case on the basis of the scriptures of Israel while simultaneously uh, saying that the scriptures of Israel are no longer valid. Yeah, yeah, it's a real catch twenty two, right? I mean, the, right. The, 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 it only works if you if you take it all as it is. That's it. That's it. Exactly. You've got to take it all. I I remember like the moment that it it came to me. It's like the Old Testament's in the Bible in the Bible for a reason. Yeah, <laughs> the Old Testament's in the Bible. <laughs> like yeah. Mar- Marcion Marcion lost, okay, and he should have lost, and that was good That's that he right. lost. That's right. We, we, and 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 like like Baruch Hashem that this was all preserved for us. It is a miracle, you know. And and yeah. I have to like a lot of times. You know, maybe people you know, listening to us think, oh, these guys hate Christianity or something like that. No, <laughs> you know, that not at all. Not the case. You know, we wouldn't be sitting here talking about this whatsoever if it wasn't for the the faithful witness of the Christian church, the Catholic church, to to deliver these scriptures to us intact into our hands, you know, to be able to mm-hmm. to be able to sit and 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 meditate on these things and say, what what was really going on? We wouldn't even have that opportunity if it wasn't for the the historical witness of the church. Yeah, for sure. All right. So I don't know if ever, if ever, everyone can see this. You know, I have like a dozen commentaries on uh, Hebrews back there, mm-hmm. and I have I have uh, maybe a dozen on uh, Romans. Yeah. And I think I think probably there's some someone out there is wondering. You've done Galatians, you've done Ephesians, you've done Hebrews. Romans seems to be um, 
uh, where a lot of where a lot of people hit a snag, right? So yeah, is is there is there? I have like I have some good commentaries. I have Joe Shulam's commentary back there. So like, but but I would like, uh, is there is there ever going to be a Daniel Thomas Lancaster commentary on Romans? On Romans. I don't know. Um, I feel like in a sense, if you if you if you understand Galatians, which was written before Romans, uh, if you understand Galatians. Uh, you will understand Romans and don't need a lot of help. Um, the the thing is to understand Galatians, and most people don't understand Galatians because again they're they're looking at Galatians saying, "Oh, Paul was Paul's saying the law is done away with." Yeah. And so if you take that into Romans, you're lost. You will be oh, lost. Oh, for sure. Yeah. You know, but if you understand Galatians, you understand what Paul is really addressing the issues he's addressing. You should be able to go into Romans without, you know, getting so lost. Um, as you know, with God's help, I'm, I keep writing. I just keep writing, keep teaching. This is the only thing I'm good at. Um, you know, I wish there was something else. You know, yeah. I wanted to be a never stop. I know I wanted to be a rock star. It didn't work out. Um, but uh, you know, so yeah, I know, right? You think that's funny, but I know the truth about you too, man. You play a mean bass guitar. <laughs> you play, in fact, I've, any I've, instrument you pick up, you 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 seem to like know, like magically know how to play every instrument on. on it's the Earth. only thing. So, it's the only thing I really have, Dan. Yeah, it's the only yeah. thing I really have. You know, so this is what this is what you're good at. This is what I'm good at. This is what we do uh, is Bible teaching. You know, so as long as God gives us health, gives us years, you know, you know we keep working. But um, Romans is not on my list you know, right now. Um, I want to do Peter. I want to, I want to, I've oh, done yeah. a lot of work. I've done a lot of work with Paul. Um, so I want to go over and spend some time with, with Peter next first and second Peter. And as long as we're picking up first and second Peter, we might as well pick up Jude. Um, mm-hmm. So oh, yeah, Jude wanna, is, Jude is amazing. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, that would be my dream the, would be the weird, the weird call out to like um, Enoch. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. There's such it's that, Jude is like the most apocalyptic Jewish book of the New Testament where it's just like right in your face. Yep. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's it's going to be a thin book because there's not very much to Jude. Well, th- but that's what I'm thinking. We'll bundle them. We'll do first oh, Peter, yeah, second yeah. Peter and Jude and bundle them together. That's that that could be that's that could be it. Well, I think everyone listening to this is going to be looking forward to that. Yeah, well, and and you know, first things first, I got to knock out this second. You know, well, it's it's pretty much already written, but we got there is there in the next twelve months we'll have a volume two of Holy Epistle of the Hebrews coming out, and so this one just covers chapters one through seven, and then we'll with God's help we'll finish the epistle in, in a few months. Yeah, first things first. I I keep forgetting that it's only volume one. Yep. We'll have to do it. We'll have to do another episode when he finished the other. Yeah, right. No, I'm I'm always good for for that. Yep. Nice. All right. I think that's all she wrote. Yeah. All right. Very good. Thank you for the opportunity. Thanks for the conversation, Jacob. Oh, absolutely. You know, anytime. Thanks for joining us today on Messiah Podcast. If you're interested in learning more about the Jewish Jesus, check out First Fruits of Zion at ffoz.org. And if you enjoyed this episode, please give us a five-star rating wherever you're listening. Messiah Podcast is made possible by the generosity of our First Fruits of Zion friends. FFOZ friends are people like you who support our mission and get loads of exclusive Bible commentary, teaching, and content. You can join today at ffoz.org. Tune in next time for more great conversations. Until then, I'm Jacob Franzak. Shalom. Like the waters cover the sea